praise you, Lord, because you are God. We bow before you. Help us in these moments, Lord, to direct our focus to you. Bring renewal to the weary, confidence to the discouraged, and comfort to those hurting and in pain. Fill us with new power that comes from faith, new motivation that comes from hope. And we pray as we begin in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I'd like to introduce Paul Rauer, who was one of the students of Jim Wacker. We will give our introduction of Jim. The first time I heard about Coach Jim Wacker, I was a senior in college at Concordia College in Seward, Nebraska. And I can remember asking our head football coach, Ron Harms, who was a very good friend of Jim's in college, what this new line coach was like. And Coach Harms said, oh, you'll like Jim Wacker. He's big, he's loud, and he's enthusiastic. And I don't think things have changed all that much over the years. There are a couple other qualities that I wanted to mention about Coach Wacker uh, in introducing him. One is that quality that he has to look for the very best in the people that he works with. That kind of a philosophy has, has propelled him to an outstanding coaching record, winning four national titles, national coach of the year twice, and in fact, uh, the second time he won national coach of the year honors, it was for taking the TCU, Texas Christian University football program that had won only 17 games in the 10 years before he gained, came to his eight and three season, his second year there, and a berth in the Blue Bonnet Bowl. The other characteristic that I wanted to mention about Coach Wacker is his integrity. That's something I've admired about him all these years. And that third year at TCU, his integrity was tested to the limit. There were some people who were picking Texas Christian to win the Southwest Conference that year, but early in that season, Coach Wacker became aware that there were players on his team who were receiving payments from boosters, which was a direct violation of NCAA rules. This payment plan had been put in place before he had ever come on the campus. Coach Wacker acted quickly and decisively. He suspended the seven players in the team. One of those players was Kenny Davis, who plays for the Buffalo Bills. He was considered one of the top football players in the country that year and a Heisman Trophy candidate. For his actions, he received national attention for a man who really stood by his beliefs. But surprisingly, from the NCAA, after self-reporting this incident, Texas Christian was given one of the most severe penalties ever meted out to a Division I program with a loss of 30 scholarships. But Coach Wacker persevered. He rebuilt the Texas Christian University football program to a point where in 1991 they once again could challenge for the conference championship. And it was at that point after that season that Coach Wacker took the head football position at the University of Minnesota. Coach Wacker has been a man who has had the courage to stand by his beliefs. And for that reason, I'm very proud to present to you today Gopher football coach Jim Wacker. Uh, 
then from there on to uh, Augustana College in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, not too far from there. And then from there, uh, finally my first head job was at Texas Lutheran College down in Seguin, Texas. So all of those, of course, being Lutheran institutions, a lot of Lutheran roots, and uh, very familiar with Lutheran education, and I just want you to know I believe very strongly in it. Uh, some of those experiences, without a doubt, had a profound impact on my life, uh, teaching in Portland in particular. Uh, there was an outstanding faculty out there. In fact, Paul Brower ended up teaching out there after I did, and I think I had a little something to do with him getting on out there, a very strong recommendation to some of my friends that were still back there. Uh, but, uh, well, I remember after chapel every day there, we used to have a period like you do, a break, you know, about a 20-minute period, and it was always fun to go in there and the faculty and uh, they had every day there would be some kind of theological argument going on in there, okay? I was too dumb to ever say anything, but I listened a lot, and that was good. <laughs> so uh, you're going to have to just uh, bear with me, kind of, okay? The first thing I want you to know as far as today, no new revelations, okay? Remember, I'm not a theologian. I don't even know what that word means. I've become a football coach. So <laughs> if there are any heresies, take it, you know, kind of with a grain of salt, okay? And after all, they will straighten me out after. Okay? <laughs> um, but I thought, what in the world to talk about? I said, man, let's go ahead and hit it. Okay? Let's talk about the big question. Very simply, what is life all about? What gives life meaning? Once again, no easy answers, just some thoughts. Some thoughts. Thought number one, let's go to a story in Scripture, huh? Let's go to a story that happened about 2,000 years ago. There were some scribes and some Pharisees, learned churchmen and scholars of their day, that were trying to back Jesus in a corner. And finally one of them asked, okay, Jesus, in a sense, if you're so smart, let's hear you summarize all of the laws of Moses and all the commandments. And Jesus thought for a moment, and then he said simply, Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. That is the first and the greatest commandment. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Folks, I don't know much, but I do believe this. To this day, and for the history of the world, that's the greatest summation of what life is about that was ever made, that ever will be made. What's he saying? I say, number one, the first thing we better have squared away, and that's our relationship with our God and our Maker and our Savior and our Redeemer. Because if that relationship's messed up, good luck, nothing else matters. Your life is not going to find meaning. Your life is not going to be fulfilling. You're going to run into all kinds of problems. Have that relationship squared away. Well, if we're going to have that square relationship squared away, I guess the next question you've got to ask is, well, if that's the case, God, what do you really like? What do you really like if we're supposed to have some kind of relationship with you? There again, I remember as a youngster growing up in the church, kind of my image of God for a while. I had this image of a guy sitting up there in heaven in a great big golden throne with a long white beard and a great big club. <laughs> Boy, I remember that image well. And you know what? That image still kind of back in my mind every once in a while pops up, okay? Maybe there's some truth to that image. I don't know. That image bothers me a little bit, real frankly. And, but I think some of us uh, have to struggle with that one at times, and I think that's kind of maybe a shame. You know, because all the time, all it seemed like he was doing up there was keeping an eye on little Jimmy Wacker. <laughs> and he couldn't wait for me to mess up. And boy, when I did, I knew one thing. He's coming to get me with that big club, all right? <laughs> one way or another, this is going to happen. Well, as a youngster, you have different visions and different ideas, and then you grow up and you mature a little bit and you hear different ideas. And finally, if I had to give a definition for God today, what would it be, huh? I'd go to the second shortest verse in Scripture. You all know what that is. God is love. That's it. That's it. You want to describe him in one word? That's it. God is love. God is a God -like. God is reaching out and caring about others. God is always being concerned about being more of a giver than you are a giver. Someone once said that's the greatest mystery in the whole world. That 
giving is more important than getting. And boy, to understand that. A lot of what Jesus' life was about was that, wasn't it, huh? Because there, they, remember another story. Another story. I, I remember back in Seguin, uh, I had three boys, and uh, they were all in Sunday school at that time age. Steve must have been all seven years old, eight years old, and we're driving to Sunday school, and, and Steve all of a sudden says, Dad, what's your favorite Bible verse? And of course, what had happened was his teacher told him he had to have a Bible verse for what he did. <laughs> and so he was going to hit up on that if he hadn't done his homework, all right? So, so I all of a sudden had to come up with one. And, but I thought it was a good question. Oh, that's a good question. And they, my answer at that time would still be the same answer that I would give today, I think. And I told them, Steve, I think it's simply the verse when Jesus was hanging on the cross. And he screams out, Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You talk about the epitome of love. That's it. In all of Scripture, in all of literature, the literature, the history of the world. That is the clearest personification of love I think we can ever find. Here he had just been betrayed, whipped, and beaten, and scourged, and spit upon, and mocked, and all his friends had left him. And then they nailed him to that cross. He's hanging there in pain and agony, dying. And who's he concerned about? Huh? Those very people that nailed him. Separating the sheep and the goats. Remember that one, huh? <laughs> Never. Sure didn't. I, mean, I always kind of like goats, but that story, they're the bad guys. I, I figured that one time. You know, he always talks about that. There should be gnashing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. That one always bothered me, too. I know I didn't want to go there. Uh, I don't know what it means exactly, but I didn't want to go there, okay? But when he's talking about separating those two groups, he's talking about the sheep, huh? And those that go over to this side, and, and one of the sheep asked him, and they said, but Jesus, why? Why were we picked as good guys? Why were we picked as your sons? And he wouldn't say, huh? He said simply, because uh, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick. I was in prison and you visited me. And they asked, but Jesus, when? When did we see you sick or in prison or naked or hungry? What did he tell them? In as much as you've done it to the least, notice the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. He's saying, go out in the world and get involved. Care for others. Be a giver, not a getter. And when we are, when we follow that victim, hey, then we have life as it's supposed to be lived. Because I think what he's saying there more than anything else, more than anything, life is relationships. Life is relationships. And you have those relationships squared away, your life squared away. Those relationships, by the way, I think always start with that circle of people God puts closest in our life. 
I think so often we want to go save the world. We want to go, you know, oh, way over there, love those people. Uh -uh. He said, it starts off with those in your immediate circle. Your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, your husband, your wife, your kids. Then it reaches out to classmates, your teammates, employer, employee, all those lives that we come in contact with day in, day out. He said, that's where you're at. That's where I command you. Go and love them as you love yourself. You know, the third area, the third area I think as we study scripture, and we try to ask, hey, what does God expect of us? The third part of life, I think, comes down to a word we've all heard many, many times, and that's simply the word integrity. Integrity. What is integrity? It's not a real big deal. Basically, I think just simply saying, hey, there's a set of principles I believe in. I believe this is right, this is wrong, and I'm going to try to do what's right. I'm going to do it all the time. Hey, I'm going to mess up lots, folks. God tells us that. God tells us that. It's, it isn't going to be real pretty and perfect all the time. Remember the two guys, the best story there in all the scripture, this is always one of my favorites, huh? The two guys in the temple, Jesus walks in with a couple of disciples and there, they, the one guy, the Pharisee, whoo, man, he's saying there, standing and saying, God, thank you, I'm not like these other men, especially like that publican over there, because man, I go to church all the time, and then, you know, and I, boy, I do all the things I'm supposed to do, and I study scripture, and I talk. That's a big one. Well, I give 10% of all I earn, God. Oh, God. <laughs> then there was that publican, huh? The publican was over there, and the publican, the hated tax collector, the Jew that was working for the Romans, for the enemy, cheating the people. He simply fell down on his knees, and what did he do? He simply prayed, Father. Father, have mercy on me. What did Jesus say, huh? That guy's sins were forgiven. That guy is at one with his God and his maker. Why? Because that's still the essence of the Christian faith. That man is living a life, striving now to live a life of integrity. Because once he gets up from his forgiveness, then he is saying, hey, go live according to those principles you're supposed to live according to. Man, is that critical. When we went to TCU, <coughs> first year we knew we had some problems. And uh, so we wrote a little ditty on integrity. You know, coaches are, have to do that. You know, you read them in team meetings, you put them on the bulletin board, all that sort of good stuff, all right? But at any rate, <coughs> this is what we think integrity is. Integrity is developing a set of principles and then striving to live according to them. Integrity is having a strong conscience. And it's listening to it as you struggle with the tough decisions in life. Believe me, the tough ones are out there. Integrity is striving for excellence in every endeavor. It's striving to give the best that you have in you for every common task, for every worthy cause. Again, be concerned about others. Be concerned about what's right and what's right. Integrity is living according to the courage of your convictions. It's having the intestinal fortitude to do what you must do. Integrity is standing up for what is right and condemning what is wrong. Without, and this is a tough part, without being self-righteous in the process. Integrity is being honest and fair, first with yourself, then with your loved ones, and finally with all your fellow men. A person of integrity thanks his God for the gift of life. They attempt to love and forgive as they have been loved and forgiven. Integrity does not guarantee wealth, success, status, or power, but it does ensure the respect and the trust of others, and the peace of mind and the inner strength, knowing that you have lived your life as it was meant to be. Once again, folks, I don't know nothing about anything. I'm a dumb football coach, okay? But I do believe this. If 
we do strive to live our lives with integrity according to the rules that God has laid out for us, first in the Ten Commandments, then in the personification of the Son, Jesus Christ, who, by the way, I love the description, German theologian, Von Hafer had for him, the man for others, he referred to Jesus, the man for others, I like that, because that's what he says, that's what we're to be, the man for have a life in integrity, to have a strong relationship with our God and our Maker, our Redeemer and our Savior, and of course, to then look out and care for others, reach out, touch lives, let them in, and make a difference. That is what it's about, as best I can tell. Thank you for letting me be here with you this morning. God bless you. Have a great, great year. Just be thankful that you're at this wonderful university where you can find out about life, where you can test your faith and your values, where you can share and grow. You've got a wonderful opportunity to make the best of it. Thank you. God bless. We'd like to give you something. When you think of Jim Wacker, I guess you think of all of his energy and the fact that he probably packs more into a, an average day than five of us put together. So I think of time and uh, the old adage, uh, time flies when you're having fun, comes to mind. Of course, Kermit the Frog said, time is fun when you're having flies. <laughs> <laughs> we would like to present you with uh, celebration of our, uh, our new relationship and also a chance to, for him to keep track of time and think of Oxford at the same time. It is a uh, nice. good spot for that. <laughs> <laughs> Receive the benediction and then we'll close by singing the first stanza of hymn 557. <coughs> May we, the people who bear the name of Christ, follow the example which Jesus gave. May our faith, our hope, our courage, our purpose turn hatred to love, conflict to peace, and death to eternal life. And may God bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us ourselves to eternal life. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks. In 557, please stand. Shake the hand of Jim. He will be around during community time. We'll have to leave in a few minutes, but he'll have a few seconds to greet you. So, goodbye. <laughs>